I totally hear you. All right, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Michael Munson. I'm very happy to be back with you all today. Um, I'm seeing some faces, well, not faces, I'm seeing some little names in the attendees list from last week. So um, welcome back and um, welcome to the folks that are just joining us. Um, so I am Michael Munson with Forge from the not sunny Wisconsin right now. And this is part two of two. So this Today we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, disability and trauma and uh, transness all kind of together. Um, and let's get started. So I wanted to start today with an acknowledgement of the land that I'm sitting on today, which is uh, the sacred land of the Potawatomi, the Ho-Chunk, and the Menominee peoples. This is the homeland that's um, along the southwest shores of the Michigami, the, um, the largest North American uh, freshwater lake system, and where the Milwaukee and Menominee and Kinnikinnick rivers meet. For a visual description, um, not of the beautiful land, um, beautiful sacred land that I'm on, but a visual description for those who want to know what I look like. Um, today I have on a very bold, wildly paisley colored, well, it's not paisley colored, paisley shaped reddish colored shirt with a black t-shirt underneath. I have relatively short hair and a graying beard, glasses, and behind me is a kind of corny looking black um, drape. Um, so that's a little bit of a visual description. So our agenda for today is um, both simple and complex. So we're gonna start out with who we're talking about. We'll frame some concepts so that we're all kind of on some of the same pages for what we're gonna be talking about um, for the rest of the time. We'll look at some of the intersections between transness, trauma and disability and a whole bunch of other intersections. We'll talk some about data. Um, I hope that it will not be too data heavy, um, which I tend to be. Um, and then we're gonna look at some practical and creative ways of working with trans survivors with disabilities. So the things that you can do, and then we'll round out with um, resources. So, um, just to let folks know, um, my colleague Shelly Gregory is on the call and is going to do some back end work for me, um, for all of us today. So um, thank you, Shelly, for, for being in the background. And um, we'll do a, an exercise where Shelly is going to kind of add to a Google document that we can all uh, look at and see. So again, if you were here last time, you have seen this slide. If you were at any other Forge presentation, you've seen this slide. So please take care of yourself. And that can mean whatever it means for you, whether that is stepping off early, which I know some people need to do, or you know, getting some water or going to the bathroom or having a smoke or whatever it means to you, please do that for, for yourself. Um, participation is optional. Most of the participation will be in chat today which brings me to how we're gonna interact. So primary way will be through chatting in the chat box or the Q&A box, which has an anonymous feature if you wanna ask a question and not identify yourself. We'll interact today by voice. If people have a question that they would like to ask by voice or a comment, we can we can go there, I think. Um, and then the third way is, like I mentioned, Shelly is gonna be doing some backend Google document that we're gonna share out live. Let me give you a brief description of Forge. I'm gonna give you the truncated version um, since I gave a broader version last time. Um, we are a 27 year old trans organization that is 100% focused on anti-violence issues. We have three staff who are in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and the rest of our folks are across the country. Um, not very many folks because we have a very small staff. About 25 or so percent of our time is doing direct service with trans non-binary folks and loved ones. And around 75% is working on training and technical assistance. So webinars like this one. Just a couple of reminders of what guides our work, which is um, you know, twofold. It's about being trauma-informed with survivors and with you all as providers. And the second part is to be empowerment based. So again, that's not just with survivors, but it's with who you all are as uh, providers of services. 
you can find us on social media. Um, I will let you all figure that out when you get the slides, um, but we like to connect with folks on social media and that's where we um, are able to share information in a, a pretty easy way, just like um, the rest of you all do. So I wanted to start us off with just a little bit of kind of the who um, we're talking about today. So we're talking about a, a very both large segment of the trans community and a very specific segment. So we're talking about trans folks who live with disabilities, who are survivors of some form of victimization. Um, and so when we talk about who's included, it might be a lot of people from a lot of different identities. And we're gonna go into that a little bit more deeply in a little bit. So we're gonna piece out a little bit um, what's in that trans bucket what's in that disability bucket, and what's in that trauma bucket. Um, the folks that are on the screen right now are um, five folks who have, have been really out there in terms of being trans um, or non-binary, who are survivors and who live with disabilities. So on the screen are Gabriel Foster, Aaron Phillips. Um, Aaron Phillips is, is fun to Google. Um, they have some fantastic videos. Um, they're a model and they're just funky and cool. Um, Sebastian Margaret, who's done a lot of um, intellectual, fun, good, positive work. Uh, Drago is um, one of my old, old, old friends who's um, a deaf, trans and queer activist um, out in San Francisco. And Erica Dixon, um, who's also a really intersectional person and frames things in some really interesting um, ways. So those are just five out of thousands of folks that we could talk about today. So let me start with framing things in a, in a couple of different ways. So the first one is that in disability culture, um, a lot of times people talk about person first language. We talk about that with survivors as well. Um, sometimes in trans communities, we talk about person first language too. So I just wanted to remind folks that I'm gonna be switching between two different types of, of ways of talking about people and things. So one is that person first language where we um, are putting the person before their subsequent identities. And I'm also gonna be talking in ways that really do center the identities of individuals. So for some trans people, for example, it's trans people versus a person who is trans. So sometimes people really have that centrality of identity that they want to have coming out first. Um, it's a reclamation of that identity and it's a way that they respect and they, they embody that identity. So. Again, we can kind of switch back and forth between those languages of, of making sure that it's like a person with disability. And then for other folks, it might be, you know, it's a mad person. It's a person that, you know, so we can, we can look at those things in a different way, depending on um, how we're talking about different people. That was really wordy, but basically I'm doing so with respect. Um, and I encourage you to do whatever you need to do in terms of thinking about language. So some of the time today, you might ask yourself, is that a disability? Um, because there's a selection of stuff today that you may not see as disabilities. Um, and this goes back to, again, what is the person who has that identity or that experience? What do they think of it? So you may not think of it as a disability. They might not think of it as a disability. And the same is true for transness or survivorship. So um, again, you know, we, this is another both and situation of we want to honor people that do have the history of or living with disability, transness, or survivorship. And we also want to recognize that that may not be how everybody would identify themselves or how we might think of somebody if it's not visible to us or it's not um, something that's obvious. So like I just kind of mentioned, if you have language that you prefer to use, I encourage you to mentally substitute language. If I say something that's not within your realm of how you think about transness, disability, or survivorship, swap out that language. The concepts are what's important and the language is a little bit less important. So today we're gonna to do, like I mentioned in the agenda, we're gonna do some kind of practical um, pieces of what you can do that'll come at the end. And then between now and that practical section, we're gonna talk about data. We're gonna you know, get into kind of the weeds a little bit with how these pieces intersect with each other. 
So for those of you who were, who were here last week, um, it feels like a long time ago, but it was last week, we talked a lot about ACEs and we talked a lot about trans-Pacific ACEs. So I'm not gonna review the ACEs part because I think a lot of you know what the adva ad adverse childhood experiences are. And for those of you who were not there last time, we talked about trans-Pacific ACEs. And just a rundown, a very, very brief recap of those trans-Pacific ACEs. Um, we, we talked about eight of them last week. So number one was bullying. A second was denial of identity. A third was being expelled from home or being expelled from school. A fourth was around police misconduct and some of the intersections with police misconduct. We talked about microaggressions and minority stress. Those two things kind of go together, but they're distinct. And then we talked about legislative discrimination and culture-wide discrimination as both additional trans-Pacific ACEs. So this was a slide that I did show last time and I just wanted to, to bring us up to speed about um, the disproportionate rate that um, trans folks have compared to the general population. So um, just a reminder to us all that um, trans folks are experiencing quite a bit higher levels of ACEs than the general population. So all of this kind of ties into the social determinants of health and those are, I always think of them as really big words, um, even though they're really some simple concepts. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into us being healthy or not healthy. Um, a lot of things go into our well-being um, and if we're able to access certain things or not. So some of the things we were born into, so we might have been born into poverty, we might have been um, born as a person of color. Um, there's a lot of things that we kind of bring in from birth or that we were born into in terms of a construct or a culture. We have those ACEs pieces, those things that happened to us in childhood. We have current realities. So things like COVID is a social determinant of health or things like war that's going on right now. Those are things that impact our health. And then how we live and work are also social determinants of health. So if somebody's working um, a hard labor job, um, that's going to impact their health versus somebody who sits at a desk um, and is not using their body in a more physical or exerting way. When we look at how many trans folks live with disabilities, we don't have great data um, because we just don't. Um, the best data we probably do have is from the US trans survey that was conducted about five years ago. They are in the process of kind of redoing the survey. Um, they had an exceptionally high response rate um, five years ago. So they had almost 28,000 trans respondents. And of those, just about 40%, so 39% identified as having at least one, if not multiple disabilities. So we can kind of keep that in the back of our head that around 40% of trans people live with at least one disability. So I wanted to, to just add this concept in here before we talk about another kind of philosophical concept. And you might hear me talk today a little bit about like how many spoons do people have? Um, and if for people that are not familiar with that, spoons is this, this disability driven term of like, how much energy do I have today? How many, how many literal spoons do I have allocated today? And if I'm out of spoons, I've used them all, I don't have any, any energy to do anything else. So it's a really simple concept, but you'll hear folks in disability communities oftentimes talking about, I'm out of spoons. Um, or I only have one spoon left, you know, kind of implying that people have to um, pick and choose their activities if they have things that will um, tap them out. And so they have to pick very carefully where they are um, and what they, they focus their time on. So I wanted to talk about one philosophical concept that's gonna kind of override a lot of the, the work that we're gonna do today. And that is uh, this concept of master status or the label of primary potency. Um, some of you may have heard me talk about this before. It um, was originated in the 1940s by Everett Hughes and then kind of reinvigorated in the mid fifties by Gordon Allport. And let me just read you what this says because it's kind of a little bit wordy, but it frames what we're talking about. 
So master status and the labels of primary potency refer to the tendency of the observer to believe that one label or demographic category is more significant than any other aspect of the observed person's background, behavior, or performance. So that can mean a lot of different things. This was developed in a, in a time when people were looking at race, which we're looking at right now too, obviously, but um, in framing things in a way that people would assume certain things about somebody because of the color of their skin. This concept is applicable across many different things, many different identities, not just race. It can be about transness, it can be about disability, it can be about survivorship, religion, lots and lots of different things. So when we move through today, I want you to have in the back of your head, if you can, this concept of master status thinking. So when we look specifically at trans folks and master status, there's a bunch of ways that this can play out. So when a provider um, makes gender the primary issue versus sexual assault or disability or other issues that the client's prioritizing, that's that provider engaging in master status thinking. So some of how that comes out in how it plays out in action are providers that ask curious questions. So that might be about somebody's trans history or their experiences like, you know, hey, what's what's on your birth certificate or what sex were you really assigned, you know, at birth? Some of those questions that oftentimes are not necessary to ask. It can also also show up with the types of questions that um, are being asked by the provider, so which recenter the uh, the conversation on transness for for this example. It can also be that providers are asking intrusive questions or invasive questions. So a lot of trans people um, have had at least one time in their life where a provider is asking about their genitals and they're not seeing that provider for anything related to their genitals. So those invasive type questions where people think that they have a right to know those, those questions and their, their, those answers are what I mean by invasive questions. Many times providers may redirect conversations. So back to transness versus why somebody's there. So if somebody's there because they've been sexually assaulted um, and the provider keeps on going back and asking questions about transness, that's master status and action. And then there, the other small piece that we can bring into the master status kind of equation is looking at causality or correlation. So a provider may um, think in their head, well, because this person is trans, that, that's why they've experienced X, Y, or Z types of abuse, types of disability, or they may make other correlations between those two. So let's use the chat, which is such a great feature of Zoom. And I'd like to ask you, where else do you see master status thinking or actions in your work or in your life? So um, it doesn't have to be about trans master status, but kind of like what other master status thinking comes up for you? So somebody said um, SES, so socioeconomic status, I'm presuming, I'm guessing. Race, mm -hmm. ageism, yep. What other things are master status? What other things do we do people pick out um, and think that it's like the most important thing? Education, being married, mm -hmm. sexuality. Mm -hmm. What are some other things that we as a culture kind of, it, it's kind of about prioritizing, right? It's kind of about saying, this is what we think about first. Um, where are you from? Gender. Mm -hmm. Weight, yes, that's excellent. Um, citizenship. Mm -hmm. All of those things can be where we go um, in our heads. Uh, pregnancy status. Mm -hmm. Yeah, immigration status. Yep. Occupation. Right. Right. So all of these things can come from our personal perspectives. Somebody wrote felony. Exactly. And, and it's how we might frame the world or how our parents frame the world or how our colleagues frame the world. So I'm seeing disability there, lots of things. Excellent, thank you for participating in the chat. You can keep it going if you'd like to keep on um, typing in some things. So like you all have just pointed out, master status can play out for disability, for survivorship, and for a whole bunch of the things that you all have listed and many, many more that we haven't talked about today. 
So throughout today, you will see uh, photos of folks that we have permission to share their photos of um, throughout trainings and presentations. Um, all the photos have at least one trans person in them, and many of the folks uh, have experienced trauma, and many of them have also um, been living with disabilities. So let's talk about some intersections. Um, and Shelly is going to bring up a document. I'm going to share it in just a moment. Um, but we want to focus today on these three concentric, not concentric, three overlapping circles, right, of, of transness, disability, and trauma. And we'd like to dissect a couple of them through some kind of call out. And um, I'm not sure if folks can unmute themselves. We can do this either verbally or in the chat. And then Shelly's going to type things into kind of a neater format. So um, let me unshare my screen and then reshare it with that document. OK, are folks seeing the document that says what kinds of disability do people live with? Thank you. Um, I appreciate that, especially because I can't see y'all. So we're going to start with this question. So um, again, if you're able to unmute, unmute yourself and let's play play nice and, and smooth, hopefully, if not right in the chat. So what kinds of disabilities do people live with? So hearing impairment, learning. We're going to see how fast Chelly can type too. So um, psychological, mental health. Um, multiple chemical sensitivity. Sight. Chronic illness. Neuroatypical or neurodiversity, potentially, if I can rephrase that. Um, there's another chronic illness, which is up there. So diabetes. A visual which might be the same as sight, maybe different. Uh, mobility, prosthetics. What other kinds of disabilities might people be living with? Chronic depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. Breathing disorders. Uh, disordered eating. I believe learning was said early or on. Um, developmental or cognitive delays. Yes, thank you. Substance use disorders. That's great. Thank you. Th those are really great answers. Um, and I'm just going to scroll back up so we can kind of all see the, the list a little bit better. Um, so one more, Shelly, is a neuropathy or carpal tunnel, traumatic brain injury. Thank you for adding that. Yep. Um, autoimmune conditions. Perfect. Not perfect for autoimmune conditions, but um, I really love the, the list that you all have created. Excellent. Let's switch gears. Thank you for um, making that list. Um, so let's move down to what kinds of trauma do people experience? So what kinds of trauma could people experience? Okay, so we've got war, sexual violence, homelessness, childhood sexual abuse, bullying, Natural disasters, um, 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 sorry, I'm missing out on um, childhood physical abuse, family upbringing, abandonment, loss of a parent. Y'all are really, really prolific. Um, and Shelly's keeping up. Hey, thank you, Shelly. Um, generational trauma. Um, discipline from parents, in quotes. 
a single event or an ongoing trauma. Mm -hmm. Poverty. Chaotic households. Car accidents. Police violence. Medical trauma. This is fantastic, y'all. This is a really great religious trauma. Attachment. All forms of neglect, so medical, physical, emotional. Um, there can be medical trauma, which I think, yep, medical trauma is there already. Um, cults, that's excellent, yeah. Um, domestic violence was mentioned already. Prejudice. Isolation. Natural disaster, which I think might be there already. Um, DV, war, uh, racial violence. And systemic racism. Um, and I'm not keeping up with Shelly and, and moving down the screen. So homophobia or transphobia? Um, parents being deported. Witness to community violence. Trafficking. Healthcare inequities. You know, y'all, I didn't expect y'all to come up with this many things. This is really fantastic. Um, thank you. Uh, divorce. Sexism. Uh, death of a parent. Ableism. Employer abuse. Financial abuse. Pandemics. prison sentences. And Shelly, I'm going to stop reading off. Actually, we're almost done. So incarceration, which I think is um, up, up there, and then uh, loss of a parent to prison, mental health, or drugs. Woohoo, everybody. Dang. That is really impressive. Okay, so we've looked at um, types of disability. We've looked at types of trauma. Um, thank you very much, Shelly. I'm going to stop sharing that screen and go back to the other one. We will send this list out to folks um, along with the PowerPoints. Just a second. And if I can get a yes to, can you see the let's break down trauma? Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we just went through two of those those overlapping circles, um, and I'm really, really grateful for, for both Shelly, who could keep up with typing, and all of you for coming up with so many incredible examples. Um, let me show you a, a very simplistic example of how these things intersect, and then we'll talk about the trauma piece um, as we go through it. So y'all did a fantastic job. So um, this is my, my kind of slimmed down version of things. So we can look at things as two intersections right here. So like the trans kind of content on the side. So trans, non-binary, questioning, loved one. And then we can look at the types of disability across the top. So these are just a fragment of what you all came up with. So like cognitive disabilities, developmental, learning, psychological, sorry, ASL person, uh, movement, fatigue, <laughs> traumatic brain injury. So, you know, that's just a simple chart of how we can look at intersections. And so let's take a person who is trans identified and has some form of movement disability. So that's the place that we're going to have that one intersection. When we dig deeper, we can say, well, what about that trans person? How old are they? What gender vector are they? What, what sex were they assigned at birth? What gender are they living in now? When did they come out? What gender are they living in now? Um, what's their gender presentation? What is their what is what are other people's perceptions of their gender? What's their race? What's their education? What's their income? What's their religion? Are they employed? Do they have health insurance? Do they live in a big city? 
or do they live in a small community, rural community? Are they out of you know, about being trans or not? What is their social support network like? What is their social network like? Do they have a partner or not? Do they have family support or not? Do they have kids? What are their coping skills? Did they learn good coping skills growing up? What is their use of substances? Are they a veteran? So all of those things. So we're not, we're not just taking the trans line, but we're looking at all of those pieces of like, how do all of these other variables that are about their transness or could be related to their transness impact what we're talking about? We can look at that other intersection, right? So we have trans and then we have movement. So again, we can look at things like, well, when was the onset of their disability? Was it an injury um, or was it something that was there from, from birth? Was it acquired? Does it impact their activities of daily living? What is their quality of life like? Is their mobility uh, disability visible to other people or not? Do they dis disclose or share that information with other people? What other symptoms do they have? Is it just about mobility or is it a whole constellation of other things? Is their disability life shortening? Do they have access to healthcare? Do they have family support? Is there stigma associated with that mobility disability? What is their attitude or other people's attitude about that movement disability? So again, you know, it's not as simple as saying this is a trans person and they have a, a movement disability. Not that any of you are thinking that, but when we break things down, we can look at a lot, a lot of different intersections. So let's add violence into this mix. So we're going to add that third overlapping circle. So let me just share with you some more questions, right? So like I, I did that kind of with the, the two first circles, and now we're going to add in the, the, the third circle of violence. So again, what kinds of violence? You all came up with great number of things that were traumatic. So are we looking at childhood sexual abuse or are we looking at adult intimate partner violence? Are we looking at something that's hate motivated? When did the violence occur? Did it occur before or after an awareness of being trans? Before or after a disability? Was the violence perpetrated by somebody they knew or somebody they didn't know? Was the violence random? Was the trauma random? Or does the violence impact day-to-day -day safety? Was the violence hate motivated or biased? And if so, was it because of their transness, their disability, or because of race or some other demographic characteristic? So that's just a little, little teeny bit of a nutshell, right, of where we're seeing those interactions and intersections. So let me read you this quote. Um, it's from the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. Um, and it looks at these uh, intersections in, in, a, in a unique way. So it says, the limited research on health disparities for transgender people with disabilities reveals a clear trend. People with intersecting disability with intersecting disabled and transgender identities generally face heightened socioeconomic and health specific barriers and experience poorer health outcomes than people with only one of these identities. So again, it kind of reinforces the ACE mentality and the ACE model of when you have more than one of these things, whatever the these things is, there's going to be a poor health outcome. So let's look at a couple of things that might be the same or might be different. And we're just gonna look right now at disability and trans folks. So when we look at um, what trans people experience with accessing restrooms, and I know that sometimes, you know, talking about bathrooms and trans people is like really commonplace and um, I kind of get sick of it, but it's an important thing, right? If people can't find a bathroom that they can safely use. So what we know from data is that around 22% of trans people have been denied access to a restroom. So when we think about folks with disabilities, um, how many folks with disabilities have been denied access or can't access restrooms? There's a pretty parallel um, relationship here. So a lot of folks with disabilities can't access restrooms because of, you know, literally the doors are not wide enough to get into. There are no grab bars. 
Um, the disabled stall is not big enough to navigate or move a chair around. Um, it may not have braille to know which bathroom to go into, those kinds of things. Um, so there's some comparisons between what trans folks experience, disabled or not, what people with disabilities experience, trans or not. Trans folks and people with disabilities um, have a lot of experience with inappropriate questions. So like I mentioned in the beginning, I think you know a lot of trans folks get asked about their genitals, get asked about, well, what gender are you really? Um, lots of things that really are totally inappropriate. And the same is true for folks that live with disabilities. You know, I mean, people get asked really, really inappropriate questions like, you know, what happened to you and what is that? And lots of things that we won't, I don't even want to like reinforce some of those um, negative stereotypes, but there's a lot of intrusive questions that both populations experience. We can compare things to like uh, the visibility-ness of, that's a new word, visibility-ness of trans folks and disability. So we do know that when somebody is visibly trans and um, visibly is in quotes, um, their rate of violence jumps two to eight times higher depending on what study you're looking at. When we look at folks with disabilities, um, people that are living with disabilities are also at higher rates of violence and vulnerability due to their disability. So both of those things, when they're visible especially, um, are gonna raise the level of violence that happens. It's also gonna lower the level of support and access to healing that they can experience. So let's do another brainstorm. And Shelly doesn't have to type this time, which is um, a woohoo for Shelly. Um, so let's do the chat again about what else do you think is similar between people who are trans and people who live with disabilities? What other things that might be overlapping between those those two identities or those two experiences. Discrimination, marginalization, yes. Uh, seen as less than, yeah. Judgment, yeah. Poverty, yeah. Access to healthcare. Healthcare access, yes. People behaving differently or patronizing, yeah. Oppression. Mm -hmm. Others uh, not understanding the obstacles, right? Exploitation, yes. Uh, might find uh, strength in what makes them different. Excellent, thank you for the positive of that. Um, educational outcomes, lack of representation, having to explain themselves. Uh, more workplace issues or lack of jobs, um, education and job opportunities, macro level discrimination, unfamiliarity excluded in conversations, and yeah, being the object of curiosity and hostility, uh, blaming them and considering them uh, weak and that they can't fix it. God, you all are just so verbose. Thank you for all of these like multiple answers. You, right, all of these things, right, can be overlapping um, and make things kind of more heightened when both of these things exist. Um, for folks, because I know you were just kind of like adding what could be the same. So let's think about what that happens when we, we have them overlapped. So this is a poorly titled section slide. So um, I've labeled it as long-term physical and mental health implications. We're going to talk a little bit more than just that, but that's what the label is for lack of a better uh, descriptor. So last week we talked about ACEs. So just a reminder again of what we've just basically been talking about, right? Are, are the implications of the ACEs study of what happens when these things layer on each other and lead to poorer health outcomes. So this is gonna be just a couple of bits of data so that we can, again, frame things in data a little bit. So when we look at lack of healthcare, which was mentioned by several people um, as, as challenging, we can look at trans folks and again, not great data on, not great or conclusive data on how many folks don't have healthcare. So someplace between 19% and 64% of folks that are trans don't have insurance. Um, one of the good things is that a lot of times right now we're seeing more and more companies that will cover trans-specific health care, and the Affordable Care Act has allowed more people to access any kind of health care, which also is trans-inclusive. So things are changing a bit, but there's still a lot of trans folks that lack 
healthcare coverage. We can look at abuse in medical settings. And so these are kind of disparate pieces of data, but they all piece together into one story. We can, can see that there are really profound rates of sexual assault within healthcare uh, interactions and facilities, high levels of denial of care, and high levels of physical assault. So just again, something to keep in mind. So when we have these intersections of these three pieces, folks that have experienced medical harm in the past, either directly because of their disability or their transness or their trauma. There's a lot of different ways that we can look at that, but just looking at the trans piece of it, a lot of trans folks have experienced that medical trauma. When we look at kind of the division of folks that are, um, who are disabled in our country, it's someplace between 15 and 20% of the general US population that lives with a disability or lives with a disability at some point in their life. So we started out today um, using the US Trans Survey's number of 39% of trans folks that live with disabilities. There's a couple of studies that um, go a little bit higher than that. A couple go lower than that, but not very many go lower than that 39%. So we've got at least double the amount of disabilities, double, double the number of people that experience disabilities that are trans than are non-trans. We did some research um, about 10 years ago, and um, we've done a couple of, of smaller studies since then. And we asked about how many folks uh, lived with more than one disability. And as you can see on the slide, um, you know, a lot of folks just said, I have one disability or one condition. And there were 21% who lived with more than three conditions, three disabilities. So again, that's really commonplace for both trans and non-trans folks, but again, just something to kind of keep in mind that um, you may know of one disability, but there may be some others that you don't hear about or learn about. Um, I want to bring up deaf trans folks. Um, a lot of deaf folks don't consider deafness a disability at all. Other people do. So um, please know that when I'm talking about deaf folks, I'm not automatically presuming um, that that is a disability for that person. Um, I'd like to play this video. Um, some of you may know who this person is. This is Chella Mann, um, who is a, kind of a fashion model. Um, H&M is one of the stores that um, he models for. And um, he's deaf, and he was recently in some of the Marvel comic movies. I don't watch them, but he was in one of them recently. So let me play this video for y'all, and hopefully um, you can hear it or turn up your speakers if you need to. And it's not captioned. Oops, sorry. I was told that I couldn't be an artist because I didn't have the right background. I was told not to look Asian. I was told to look Asian. I was told I wasn't Jewish enough. People told me that I had to be a girl. People told me I had to wear dresses. I was told I had to fall in love with boys because I was a girl. The world tells you that you're supposed to be you, but not like that. Being disabled has taught me to advocate for myself at a very young age. I think of my mom fighting for me to have the proper accommodation as a deaf kid. It's taught me to not, not believe in limitations and not believe in just what anyone else tells you. At first, I was absolutely confused. I didn't know who I was supposed to be. But after a while, I think that you realize there's no point in living if you're not actually living as you. And I never thought that that day would come. I remember opening my eyes and seeing my family around me. All of them have been with me through it all. And I looked down and you can't see anything yet. There's so many bandages and gauze, but it was still so beautiful. And I knew that I had the body that I always wanted. It felt like a new beginning. But I just started crying and I felt really hopeful. And then I looked up and I saw my mom and she was just beaming down at me. 
and part of why I was laying there in the body that I had always dreamed of having was because of her and her unconditional love and her ability to see past what she thought was real. And that's true love, I think. So I'm gonna show a couple of videos as we go through. Um, and I think a lot of them really show resilience. Um, I, I love this video. I don't get to show it very often, um, but it's really beautiful. And it, it, when we look at those factors that influence somebody's wellness and health, um, this person had a family that loves him. Um, you know, talking about his mom who was beaming, all of those things really impact a positive outcome and a positive health outcome. So I'm going to share a couple of other things. We don't, again, we don't have really good data about who is living with a disability. Sometimes, again, we're going to look at things and go, is this really a disability? Like HIV, um, you know, a lot of folks right now with HIV, they are well medicated and are, are living um, without a lot of symptoms, um, if, if any symptoms at all. But when we look at the rates, this is where things kind of get skewed a little bit. So you can see on the slide, there's this one bar chart that is way, way, way high, and then the rest are really, really small. So in our country, about 0.5% of the population lives with HIV. When we look at trans women, especially trans women of color, it's someplace between 17 and 42% are living with HIV. That is profound. It's really, really, really high. You know, trans men, for example, are multiple times higher than the general population too, at around 3%, three and a half percent. Some people will ask why we use the word cross-dresser here. Well, that's the survey that was, um, was used and that was the language that was used. And that's what a lot of people who are older may still identify as. But cross-dressers are experiencing rates of HIV at 2%, which again is four times higher than the general population. Um, Non-binary folks, we don't have a lot of data, but in the some studies that we do have, again, it's almost three times higher than the general population. So that can be a disability. And the reasons why people are getting infected with HIV um, is one of those social determinants of health, one of those things that build and add to um, the, the entry of disease or the entry of, of disability. So Cecilia Chung is, um, uh, she's a kick butt person. She's um, done a whole lot of things in her life. And this is gonna be another story, um, both of resilience, but both of, of, of her struggle as well. So let me play this video for you. And um, was the last video loud enough? Hopefully it was for folks. Um, and if not, I encourage you to, to jack your speakers up on your end. So here's Cecilia. My name is Cecilia. I am a transgender woman. I came out to my mother in late 1991, and by close to the end of 1992, I decided to live as my true self. By 1993, my family turned their backs on me. I lost my job, had no home to go to, and by the summer of the same year, I tested positive for HIV. For the following two years, I was trapped in a nightmare. I was sexually assaulted multiple times, but was afraid to go to the police because I was doing sex work. And I began to self-medicate. I thought that was how my life would end until I was assaulted by two men on an August night in 1993. They were trying to sexually assault me. I fought back. They stabbed me, chased after me and dragged me to the ground and started kicking. Luckily, Someone called the police and they were arrested and I was rushed to the hospital. My mom came to see me and we began our reconciliation. In year 2000, I was diagnosed with AIDS. I'm currently on antiretroviral therapy, have my family back in my life, but still I cannot shake off all that ha had happened to me. I am still having the same dreams that I was trapped in a burning house with no escape. My boyfriend often hears me crying and screaming in my sleep. And to me, that manifests into depression and a sense of hopelessness. That sense of hopelessness when I absolutely have no reason to feel that way. 
I am still seeing a therapist after all these years, and I don't know when my nightmare will ever end. I'm sorry, I didn't warn folks that there was no visual, just an audio. Um, so this is a different story painted, right? So we've got Chella Man who um, had very supportive family from day one all the way through. Um, Cecilia had um, a different journey with her family. Um, and you could see multiple components of what was going on there. So she's trans, she was assaulted. Um, there are long-term implications of her HIV related to both of those streams. Let's shift gears and again, just a couple of more, more pieces of data that are around disability. So we are have a growing body of data that is talking about and seeing that trans folks are experiencing or um, experiencing is not the right word, are, are living with neurodiverse um, experiences. So um, are on the autism spectrum, have um, multiple, you know, we, we look at neurodiversity and the, the language has changed so much over the last 10 years, but there's a substantially higher rate of neurodiversity within trans populations. So someplace between three and 6%, again, kind of depending on if you're looking at, at a specific type of neurodiversity or another type of neurodiversity. Um, someone mentioned, mentioned eating disorders before too. So neuro, neurodiversity came up in the, the chat and so did eating disorders. So uh, we can look at the fact that um, trans people are far, far, far more likely to experience disordered eating than the general population. And you know, what is this linked to? Is it linked to being trans? Possibly. Is it linked to past trauma? Possibly. Is it linked to um, disabilities? Possibly too. Is it a combination of all three? Very likely, right? This is one of my favorite photos that was taken at the Philly Trans Wellness Conference. It was just like this, this just rad kind of badass look, excuse my language, um, pointing out that, you know, psychiatric conditions of, you know, being a survivor of that and, and smashing sanism. I just think it's a, a powerful, full image. So let's look a little bit at depression and mental health. So this is often overlooked, right? We don't tend to think about in our culture in America about depression and mental illness as being disabilities. Um, there's more and more folks that are thinking about it that way, but um, it's still oftentimes seen as not a real disability. Um, but for a lot of folks, it really is um, disabling. It is pervasive. It can be lifelong. And we can look at things like the co-occurrence of depression or anxiety or post-traumatic stress with other types of disabilities. So it's a chicken or an egg thing, right? We can look at either they just emerged together, one happened first and then the other happened. Um, we can look at it a lot of different ways. Um, we definitely see the emergence of depression and mental health conditions with trauma. I mean, it's an obvious to, to all of us here. And we can also see the co-occurrence of the societal strain on being trans being disabled in other ways other than depression or mental health, um, or having experienced uh, violence. So we can look at folks that are trans who have experienced um, depression at some point. It's around 67%. Again, we can look at, this was a, that's from a meta-analysis looking at multiple different surveys. Um, and when we look at folks who experience depression plus another mental health condition, that rate goes, the, the comorbidity, comorbidity rate goes up to um, 79%. Unfortunately, a lot of trans folks are still uh, hospitalized or institutionalized against their will. So it's someplace around 9% um, of trans folks that are um, being, being institutionalized, being forced into therapy, being forced into some kind of care because of their transness. And I want to share with you this fairly brief video, and this is Dylan, Dylan Schlowinski, and um, he wrote uh, a really fantastic book called The Last Time I Wore a Dress. And um, I'm just gonna play this video for y'all because it's it's fantastic and it reminds us of a couple of things um, about forced institutionalization, as well as some family dynamics and where he is today. So again, not captioned. Um, so thank you to the interpreters. It's become so important for us, you know, for as a movement, like people feel like we need to project this like we're healthy, we're just like everybody else, like we, you know, but 
if we are in fact just like everybody else, then we are disabled. We are in wheelchairs, we have cancer, and we are mentally ill. You know, we do suffer from depression, we do suffer from schizophrenia, we do suffer from, you know, bipolar disorders. But historically, because we've been labeled as mentally ill, there's just this movement to deny that we have any mental illness at all. Like, we just, we can't be crazy. Like, because that would mean that our being gay is crazy, you know, and so we internalize that. That's one of the reasons why I think we don't access care properly or, or other people don't treat us properly. You know, I am crazy and it's something that I've learned to celebrate about myself rather than, you know, give in to the stigma that the world assigns to me as a crazy person. Um, that I find it to be something that I value about myself. I value the, how sensitive it makes me to the world, how much it makes me care. You know, like that's not something to be ashamed of. So that was Dylan. Um, Dylan is also somebody that's been in my life for a while and Dylan is fantastic. And you could see that he has transformed something that was really, really, really difficult in his life into something that's really positive and sees it in a positive light. Um, he makes art, he hosts events for kids um, who are trans and queer to make art. Um, there's a lot of transformation that has gone on with him. And he's still, like he said, mad, crazy, lots of things that are, those are his words. Um, and he lives a really healthy, wonderful, beautiful life, um, even with all of those pieces. So I wanna share a slide. This is something that I believe was shown last week about the, the, the amount of suicide attempts that trans folks um, are engaged in. Um, so we can look at the general population, which is around 5% of the general population attempts suicide. And then we can look at the really, really profound data that when we look at kind of trans people as this big group of folks, um, that rate jumps to 40%. So it's really likely that if you're interacting with a trans person, they have had suicidal thoughts and suicidal actions in their life. When we add in factors like trans folks who've been sexually assaulted or have experienced intimate partner violence or have had negative um, harmful interactions with their teachers or people at school, that rate of suicide attempt goes even higher. Um, I think like I mentioned last time when we talked about suicide, I always um, wanna bring in a, a photo of somebody that is in the realm of, of at least folks that I know um, who have ended their life by suicide. So the, the person in the middle of the screen um, that's smiling, um, it's kind of hard to, to describe who it is, is the mother of a very young trans person who ended his life uh, by suicide. So she has since become quite an activist and a vocal person. So we can look at things like what are the long-term implications of violence in trans people's lives? And in terms of you know, what types of disability are people experiencing based on that violence and based on the fact that they're trans. So this, was, um, this is data from a study that we did, um, again, it was 10 years ago. And we asked folks about their sexual assault history and what types of disabilities that they were living with or if they were chronic. So um, if we start out at the highest point on this chart, 15% um, had physical scarring as a result of the violence that they experienced. So that may not be a long-term health implication, but it's a, an implication of what they see in their day-to-day -day life on their body. 10% of the folks um, in this survey said that they had long-term medical conditions, and those were as a result of the harm and the violence that they had experienced. 4% live with long-term disabilities as a result of the harm that they experienced. And then the 13% other were things like people added in that they were living with post-traumatic stress injury, um, they had chronic uh, migraines or headaches, which they didn't consider as one of those other categories. Um, they had cervical pain, they had you know, other types of things that they didn't really count as a disability, but I would count them as that way. So they listed out some other pieces. So when we look at who's providing care, and by care, I mean, who are the sexual assault advocates? Who are the attorneys? Who are the people that are interacting with, with folks like you all who are, um, are doing the helping work? 
when we look at those folks, um, you folks, us folks, we know that for a lot of providers, people may know about trauma. People might know about disability. People might know about transness. But it's pretty darn rare for people to have knowledge about all three of those circles. So this is one attempt to try to help raise that up a little bit so there's more knowledge of all three of these circles. Okay, let's talk about some positive, proactive, practical things that we can all do to improve the lives of folks that are trans, disabled, and have experienced trauma. So the first one is about a kind of a pre-check of of the space, the accessibility of the physical space. So there are a lot of checklists out there. Um, I'll include, there's one of them in the resources section at the end uh, from the Vera Institute of Justice, but we, we wanna look at our spaces and see if they're literally accessible for folks with mobility uh, disabilities, for sensory disabilities. Think about all of the, the types of disabilities that we kind of talked about before. Are those spaces accessible in our own offices, if we have brick and mortar offices. If we work with other agencies that that client might be going to, are those other spaces accessible to folks? And then what about our referral list? Do we have a referral list of therapists that have accessible offices that don't have like a set of stairs to go up or that have um, all gender bathrooms? So we wanna think about access in terms of disability, in terms of transness, and in terms of trauma. Second is to validate your um, client's agency. And so this is pretty common for folks that work with trauma survivors. So when we wanna validate someone's um, agency, the, the choices that they make over their own life, we wanna look at it in a couple of different ways. So some folks that are trans, disabled, and experience trauma may access traditional medical care. So the regular kind of doctors that we tend to think of, nurse practitioners, or they might not. They may rely upon alternative medicine or not seek medical care at all. A second piece of this is um, the harm reduction component of it. So are people engaging in practices that literally are keeping them alive versus seeing traditional providers that may end up causing more harm or making them more uncomfortable? A third piece of this um, is disclosure or masking. So um, masking is a term that uh, is not too commonly uh, heard of, I don't think, which is really about kind of like, do I mask? Do I put a mask over this part of my identity? Do I not disclose it? So there might be a decision by a person to not disclose one of these three components that we're talking about today. And the reasons might be varied. They might be because of simplicity. Um, basically, it's like, you know, I'm seeing somebody that I try for a cold and I don't need to tell them about one of these things. Um, so that's just like the easier route. Like there's no need to do that. There could be fears of um, bias or discrimination. There could be fears of um, or concerns about uh, being compromised in their care if they say that they're trans, for example, and they need medical care. Are they worried that that's going to impact the quality of their care? And we talked about spoons in the beginning. Somebody may not disclose because they don't have enough spoons, right? They just don't have enough oomph to say, hey, I need to tell you this other piece of who I am. So let me give you, this is a personal example. So this is about kind of like what is important to disclose. So if we go back to the, the whole thing about spoons, um, whether or not I'm trans is irrelevant when I seek medical care. What I care most about when I seek um, physical medical care is letting my providers know that I am very allergic to parabens and I am very allergic to local anesthetics. It is so critical that I let them know that. Otherwise, I'm going to end up in their ER, um, their emergency room, not just in their, you know, their, their private practice office. So any of the other variables about who I am, whether I'm trans, whether I'm queer, whether I'm you know, disabled in some other way, I need to let them know those two allergies. So again, that kind of goes back to the spoons concept. What do I have energy to bring into this situation? So when we look at these three concentric, three overlapping circles, which thing is important to bring up or is it something else altogether? 
So the third is we want to manage our own reactions and responses. And it's it sometimes is difficult to manage our own responses when we are surprised by something to not be you know, show that shock. Um, and sometimes we do get surprised and we can apologize for that and, and try to not have a reaction to the person with the person. So again, it can come out as surprise. It can come out as sympathy too. So, you know, is a reaction, somebody mentioned um, patronizing before. So are we saying, oh, I'm so sorry. And, you know, it really kind of gets saccharin. Um, a colleague of mine the other about a couple of months ago said, you know, oh my God, are you okay? And we were on a Zoom call and it was to um, another colleague of mine who is chronically wearing a neck collar. And so my one colleague who said, oh my God, are you okay? Presumed that it was like some injury or something that was fresh um, and not something that was chronic. And so we ended up having to debrief the three of us, the person that lives with long-term disabilities and, and has a collar, and the person that said, oh my God, are you okay? And me. So we, we, we processed that a little bit, but it was really you know, uncomfortable for the person who lives with that disability to have to hear that, oh my God, again. So number four thing that you can do or be uh, mindful of is creating accessible events and services. So there's a couple of points that go with this. So how do we create accessible events and services? We can have ASL. Thank you to Wix app for having ASL, yay. We can also have closed captioning and those two things are not interchangeable, right? So um, there's captioning here, there's ASL here. Depending on what kinds of access people need, they want, they may need or want one or the other or both. We can use image descriptions in our social media, in our newsletters, on our websites. So an example of that is um, on the screen right now is a, an image of Susan Stryker and it's got a quote underneath it. So if we would write uh, an image description of it, we would write something like bracket image, colon, background, black background, Susan Stryker dressed in black, looking intensely, legs crossed with notepad on lap. And then it says, quote text. So that would be at the body of our, our post and then the Forge logo. So that's a really simple way that you can add access um, to social media posts and, and anything that has an image. We can make sure that there's physical accessibility. So, I mean, that's what a lot of us think about initially when we think about making things accessible. So are the hallways wide enough? Are the entryways wide enough? Are there, is there a chair between seats? Um, are the bathrooms, again, like we talked about earlier, you know, are the doors big enough? Are there grab bars? Is there enough space to turn around in that stall? Can you get under a sink? Can your wheelchair get under the sink? Or is there a place to um, rack your cane? Are there lots of those things? Are they already in place? And again, I will mention the Vera tip sheet on some of the things to look through about that. Another one is about if you're creating a space, um, do you have things out on tables when we're in person um, that are like stimulation toys or things to play with or fidget with that can really help folks that live with neurodiverse conditions um, or experiences? Um, what about the lighting? Is it really bright? Is it too bright? Is it not bright enough? How can we do things so that um, the environment is not overwhelming to folks that live with disabilities that relate to those environmental stimuli? And then another piece is around transportation. So um, do we have a budget that includes allowable emergency funds so that we can help people get to our location? Um, so somebody might not have a car, they might not have um, be able to use the bus. There might not be a bus that goes to where the event or location is. Um, a lot of times um, agencies don't have transportation money or if they do have transportation money, it's for a bus ticket. And it may not allow somebody to be able to get there if they need additional space or accessibility. Um, I like to encourage folks to look at Uber Assist, um, which is a, a kind of an arm of Uber that does accessibility um, cars and driving. So I'd like to show another video just again to um, bring things into focus. Um, Tristan is, I keep on saying is, it, Tristan has been on Forge's staff, um, lives with many chronic disabilities, 
and is one of the most beautiful people in the whole world and so incredibly articulate and um, you'll see. So just another, another kind of biopic. This is so great so far. Um, when I think of empowerment um, work at Forge, I um, I love the emphasis from everyone on how we center the whole person. Um, because as someone who focuses on disabled trans survivorship, um, it's really important to me that I frame empowerment through the lens of disabled trans euphoria um, and access that encompasses disabled trans and survivor identities. Um, because so often um, when we talk to providers um, and do TTA with providers about bathroom access, um, people talk about trans bathroom access, but leave out disabled bathroom access, um, or what it takes to make a bathroom comfortable to trauma survivors um, who may need just like a quiet place to go sit down at a conference. Um, so it's really important to me when talking with providers to center all three of those identities at the same time. So when I think of empowerment with providers in TTA, um, that's sort of what I'm thinking of. And then when I think of empowerment with um, disabled trans euphoria, um, it just, it, it lights up my whole body um, because um, it's the opposite, I think, of what we're taught we're supposed to experience. Um, and it means the world to me that I get to dig in with community into what skills it takes and what kind of conversations it takes to be able to experience that inside our bodies and in our storytelling um, that exists outside of boxes. Um, because Larry is right at Forge, we don't do that trans enough conversation. That does not happen here. Um, and we also do a lot of work to um, deconstruct, um, am I a good enough survivor? That conversation does not happen here. So disabled trans euphoria is about, to me, it's about the empowerment of leaning into our own enoughness um, and how we build that up with each other. And I really see a lot of that happening in our groups and in our one-on-one -on -one work and through blog writing and um, connecting with other survivors at conferences. Um, it just, it's in everything we do. Um, and it's just, it's really good work. So I am glad that I did not cry during that. Um, I will share with folks, it's public knowledge. Um, Tristan transitioned off of our staff um, because they're now in hospice. And um, Tristan would tell me to not be sad um, and to not make any, any of those, those kinds of comments. Um, but Tristan is just incredibly beautiful and powerful. And I miss, I miss their words and their input into Forge's work and being able to share that out in the world. Let me finish off with two additional things that you can do, um, and I will try to keep my my spirit up. But um, this is part of part of life, and and you could hear Tristan's language of, you know, trans euphoria, and how that just carries them forward. Let's do these two last pieces, and then um, resources and some questions. So number five is um, acknowledging multiple ways of coping and thriving. Um, so this will remind me of Tristan as well. So, you know, sometimes people use chemicals or medications or crowdsource for their medications, either because they don't have insurance, um, they can't afford things, all of those things that go with it. So 
people may use things like cannabis that are not legal in every state, or they may um, use medication that another friend or community member is able to access, but they are not able to access. So that could be anything from pain meds to antidepressant meds to, you know, name whatever it is. Um, that may be one way that folks are, are accessing. Um, when we look at harm reduction too, there's like non-suicidal self-injury. So there's dramatically higher rates of, of non-suicidal self-injury for folks who are trans versus not trans. And again, you know, like we can look at this and, and not worry about, is this a harm? Is this something that we need to pay attention to um, when we're working with somebody or is this their way of coping with what's going on for them? We might also see people doing adrenaline or sedating activities. So just a couple of examples are like driving really fast, engaging in um, BDSM or um, you know, kinky um, sex or, or interaction play to raise endorphins. Um, it might be about like floating in um, a pool, which can be sedating or calming, um, doing things like cold plunges or hot plunges into things to change people's body chemistry. Those are some things that people can do that are that we may not think of as valid, but they're very important to those folks that are engaging in those behaviors. Um, we can also check in about who knows what. So this kind of goes back to the, the disclosure pieces of things. So who knows about transness, survivorship, disability? Um, is that person out? Are they out to everybody? Um, what about their privacy? What, what would they like you to be private about? Um, what are they private about? What about confidentiality? What about clients agency in terms of telling their own story in this process of those three circles? My cat has joined us again, so um, I know y'all saw our last time. So a couple of reminders as we move along. So we started out by talking about master status and the lab label of primary potency. So we wanna move away from that where we kind of put that, that one piece on the pedestal and everything else is related to it. And we wanna think more about the both and the and. When we think about things like curiosity, um, I always wanna encourage folks to be really curious Curiosity is really fantastic. Um, it, it's different though than being client-centered. So sometimes when we're curious, our attention gets drawn away from being client-centered. So again, when we think about it, curious mind is good. Curious mouth is not so good, right? We don't wanna be saying what we're curious about unless if it's appropriate, like if, unless if it has some appropriateness or relevance to why that client is with us. We want to stay focused in ways that are about listening and believing and being present. And we wanna kind of get away from making excuses or explanations or making it more complicated. So again, the yes list is listening, believing and being present, which is what most advocates do already. And we just wanna keep that in mind when we're working with trans folks who are survivors who live with disabilities. Um, one more video, and then I will share some resources, and we can have Q&A if that is of interest to folks. Um, this is a fantastic video that looks at the connections between disability justice and transformative justice. I do not believe this is captioned or um, ASL interpreted. It's about a four-minute video, I believe, so um, buckle up. Oops. So disability justice is a term that was coined by Patty Byrne and the Disability Justice Collective, which was this amazing crew of disabled, badass, mostly queer and trans people of color. Disability justice is really looking at creating a world where everybody, every mind, uh, regardless of how it's shaped or moves or functions in the world, um, has a place and understands that disabled folks have a lot, a lot, a lot to offer um, to our communities. And in the same vein, it's it's grounded in the agency and self-determination of a person who identifies, um, you know, like I identify as neurodivergent, um, that my agency and self-determination is prioritized uh, over, right, things like the medical industrial complex or saying that there's something wrong with me. Transformative justice is also about agency and self-determination, right, and people have understanding that we are all empowered um, 
to change our lives and to change behaviors and to transform the culture that we live in. Uh, disability justice is also trying to transform the culture that we live in to be you know, bigger and allow for more agency and self-determination from more of us. So that intersection is a super sweet spot because yeah, we're all fighting for that same thing, which is that we get to exist in the world without fear of harm just because of who we are or how we move through the world. As someone with um, who is neurodivergent and with disabilities, um, like a, a lot of how I entered into this work was through my own lived experience of trying to A, be accountable to my community and be able to show up for my community as someone who you know, very frequently has to take moves back because of how my mind and my body function. Um, but also for care to become a collective thing. Disabled folks, you know, we've never been able to rely on uh, a lot of the systems that are in place or those systems have been incredibly harmful to us. More than 50% of people who are murdered by the police are people with neurodivergence or who are neuroatypical or have cognitive disabilities, right? So for a disabled community, this is also about us staying alive. I think everyone should have a safety team. Everyone should have a community that um, loves them enough and unconditionally. Having a safety team has enabled me to be outside, to be a part of my community, um, and it also is a preventative tool. Uh, my friends know how to support me and take care of me so that I don't end up outside while I'm dissociated or episodic, which means I have less interactions with police officers, which means I have a less lesser chance of ending up back inside or really harmed by the state or the system. So when I think about transformative justice and community accountability, and again, that intersection, right, is like, this is really about um, going back to what we know is true, that our relationships are the most valuable resource that we have in, in maintaining our agency and self-determination, in getting the love and care and support we need to survive, and in shifting, right, shifting our culture kind of from the inside out. From a disability perspective, so many of us who are disabled like live in a lot of isolation because of ableism. So, and I mean, that can happen for people who aren't disabled too. I think that's true for a lot of survivors and a lot of people that they're like, what community? So I guess I also want to give a shout out because I think, you know, like community is a word in community accountability, right? And I think often there there is still this focus we have on like, oh my God, this great network of community is gonna be there and it's so wonderful. And a lot of us actually have a much more mixed experience or we're like, actually we're loners, we're hermits, we're, there's a lot of stuff that we don't actually have support around or we're actually kind of isolated. And I guess I kind of want to give a shout out to like people who might be watching this video who are living alone in their apartments or their lives who are still building lives that have safety, peace, justice, and healing, and to say that that's real too. So I see somebody asked in the chat, um, can I share the link? Um, I. I can, but right, not right now. Um, and the name of the series or the name of the, this video was Intersections of Disability Justice and Transformative Justice. Um, I will send out the link to it so that y'all can have it um, when resources are sent out. So let me share with you a couple of resources. That was a great one, um, that video, I think. Um, but here are some more that really get to all of those three circles that we've been talking about. So the person that you saw in the video at the very end was uh, Leah Lakshmi, and I can never pronounce their last name, um, but it's on the screen right now. Um, they have written three really seminal books that are just fabulous. I think everybody should read them because they're just incredible. So Care Work, Beyond Survival, and The Revolution Starts at Home, the two on the right, the last two are the ones that get talked about the most and probably read the most. So um, three really incredible books. Eli Clare is also a very uh, prolific writer, uh, mostly poet, a little bit of narrative. Um, and he has written three uh, books as well. Um, very different perspective than um, Leah Lakshmi. So again, another th set of three books that you can, can check out. Um, I think that Exile and Pride is probably the most read of his books. And it's just a stunning, stunning book. I've mentioned a couple times the tip sheets from Vera, so the Vera Institute of Justice. 
they have just an enormous amount of resources that are available for free for folks. And I, I really, really love their designing accessible events for people with disabilities and deaf individuals. So it's a really great resource that will help you think of things that um, you may not have thought about or may never think about without somebody really spelling out those points. So again, encourage you to, to look at that and to think about what your agency is structured like as well as um, having accessible events. Um, we have a webinar that's very, very old on our website, but I think is still really quite interesting um, that looks at the intersections of trans folks and disability and survivorship. Um, I was going to play a little clip of it today, but um, I thought I would just include that link here for folks if you want to go and watch the uh, the complete process of it. This actually, uh, the link to this one is uh, one that we did for the Vera Institute of Justice. Um, I think it was in 2015. Um, a couple of other resources, um, the Trans Survivors blog, uh, Tristan, who the video that I showed a little bit ago, um, was a very dominant writer in the in our blog, um, and I miss their voice a lot in it, but there are some other really powerful um, blog posts, and many of them look at the intersections of disability and trauma and transness. Again, I wanted to remind folks where you can find uh, Forge on social media and where you can contact me. Um, so you can send me email at mmunson at forge-forward.org. And if Shelly's still here, maybe you can stick that in the chat, or I will in a minute. And that is what I have for you all today. Um, and I know we're at half past the hour, which gives us a half an hour, or far less than that if folks um, would like to, to cruise. So do folks have questions? Do folks have things that they would like to share or talk about? And I'm not seeing any other questions in the Q&A box that haven't come up. Um, any comments that folks would like to make? And Shelly, since you are here, did were there any questions or any comments above that I may have missed? So I'm seeing a question of, um, do you deliver to healthcare professionals? Um, in terms of training, we most definitely do, um, if that's what you were, were asking. Um, we love training lots of different kinds of providers, so yes. And I'm seeing a, another uh, resource added, um, Fighting eat dis Eating Disorders in Unrepresented Populations, a Trans and Intersex Collective. Thank you for that. comments, questions, other resources. So I'm gonna let the WICSAP people answer the, can you get a certificate for these trainings? Thank you for posting the link for uh, Leah. Okay. Um, on that question about can certificates for the trainings. Um, let me check with that because I believe, I'm pretty sure they count for training hours, but I don't think we usually do certificates. What we do is that when we send the after email after this, like we have a, a little section where you can fill in your own name and turn it in. Um, so that's what we usually do. And for uh, the questions about the recordings for everyone who missed the first uh, webinar, we, as you can see, we are recording. Um, we recorded the first one as well. And we will be putting up those uh, recordings onto our website within the next week or two. So right now they're not up yet. Um, we're still processing them, but then we will be uploading them and they will be available um, for anyone coming to our website. Um, what else? Oh, we will be also sending you an evaluation just so that you can evaluate the, you know, this training and uh, give us feedback. Uh, so we can uh, do that. Great. Thank you for answering those questions that I don't have any clue about. And I see that there's a hand raised, um, and I am not sure. Can you unmute yourself? Do you want to ask verbally? Um, okay, wait, that's Patricia. That's also our colleague. So, Patricia, you should be able to speak now.
，一些。And yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what you said that yes, on the Wixap webpage and, and um, Patricia Flores, she, her, Aya pronouns um, on the end, I'm advocacy coordinator at Wixap. And on that Wixap on our webpage, if you want um, a training approval letter from Wixap that you attended this, you can request that on the website and um, I'll email that letter out to you with the title of this training who did it, the hours, and yeah. So if that's something that you need, you can access that information on the webpage, a training approval document. Excellent, cool. Thank you for jumping in with that because those are the important things that people care about a lot of times. Um, if there aren't any more questions or comments, um, I'm sure that a lot of us would value having 25 more minutes of our day to do other things. Um, I really want to thank everybody for being here and for Wixap to um, inviting Forge to come back and be part of this two-part series. Um, we've done some other workshops and webinars with Wixap in the past, and it is always a pleasure to, to engage this way and to have, have community and sharing our, our knowledge with other folks. So, um, and thank you for the ASL people and the captioning people who make life really good for all of us um, and for all of you who attended today. So thank you so much. Michael, what is the uh, the web address for Forge? We have a request for that since we're Yeah, it's forge-forward.org. I will put it in the chat. Um, if you go there, you can find all of our social media links as well. But um, there's a contact form if you want to reach out directly. But um, there you go. Thank you, everybody. So did you have any more that you'd like to add to close everybody out? Um, nope, I think we've gone through all of the uh, basic things. Any more questions or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me at soleil at wixap.org. Uh, you can put that in, uh, no. Sorry, I know, how to, my own, I know my own email address. There we go. Um, and, yeah, we're so excited that you are here, and we are also happy that you know we all get 25 minutes to <laughs> go out, do some self care, do some deep breathing. For those of you who have sun, enjoy it. The rest of us will just be jealous. Um, have a good day, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Hey, uh, interpreters, you are free to go. Um, captioner, you are as well. Thank you so much. We have really enjoyed having you here with us.